Welcome to Chapter 9, The Present Middle Passives. In this chapter, we're going to make the shift away from the present active indicative verb to include the middle passive voices. In order to do that, we'll have to understand how the middle and passive work in Greek. The second shift we're going to make is that originally when we did the present active indicative verb, we specified tense as equal to present tense. In this chapter, we're going to introduce some other aspects of how the present tense form manifests itself in narrative. So we're going to include aspect and a thing called action sart. So it's going to be quite a bit to learn cognitively, conceptually in this chapter, as well as uh, we've got our sixth chant for the luo verb for the middle passive. Once we get past all the cognitive stuff, we'll try to simplify things for this first year Greek class and reduce things to a basic level that we can actually work with. First, let me introduce some problems with taking the present tense as equal to time, as we did in Chapter 3. The present tense forms, like luo, luais, lue, are regularly translated as a present present. I am studying, or I study. Present tense. However, when you actually get into how this present tense form is used, it's often used for the past. So, for example, you have a historical or dramatic present, and it's translated, I studied. The Greek is actually in the present, but the English translates it as a historical past. I studied. And again, Sometimes the present tense forms are used to portray the future. I will study. Yet once again, the Greek present tense form is used to portray a future event. Sometimes you have a what's called a customary presence. Birds fly, something they usually do. It's not that they're flying right now, but we say birds fly, customary present. It's what they usually do, kind of like students study. Well, maybe that's not such a good example. Sometimes they do. Then there's a timeless or gnomic present. The wind blows. That's what the wind does. So that we have these at least five ways that the present tense form is actually fleshes itself out into present time, into past time, into future time, and then just sometimes into a generic customary present or a timeless or gnomic present. And therefore, what this slide seeks to do is to, to break your connection between the present tense as equal to time and suggest to you that the present tense forms are used and often will be translated as historical presence, or in the future, or customary, or timeless, and these other variations. So basically, just loosen up your connection between the present tense forms as equal to present time. That's not true, and we've got to look at things uh, in a much more nuanced way. Besides the tense equals time perspective, there are two other ways of looking at the verb. One of them is what's called action sart. This describes how the action of the verb takes place. So, for example, the length of action of the verb. Is it punctiliar? I studied. Or is it durative? I am studying. Durative? more stretched out, continuous action, punctiliar, and it's, it's looked at as a point in time. There are other means of how the verb happens. For example, an inceptive way. That is, it begins now. I am going home. It's something that's beginning now, 
And so this describes another action start. Iterative. Something happens over and over again. The rain falls over and over. So it's called iterative. And then there's the perfective present. It has a past action with continuing results. The rain has watered the ground. And so there's a perfective action start to that. So action start tells us how the verb actually acts, whether it's uh, punctiliar, whether it's durative, inceptive, beginning now, iterative, over and over again, or perfective, something that happened with continuing results. So we have the present tense forms as related to time in various ways. Action start, or how the action of the verb actually happens. And now we want to look at the aspect of the verb is another way of looking at the present tense. This is the author's portrayal of an action. This is not saying this is exactly how it happened, but it's how the author portrays the action. And this uh, aspect notion is, is championed by a guy named Stanley Porter. And it has some unique perspectives on how to look at these tense forms. Porter takes the present and imperfect aspect as being kind of like a parade that you're seeing in progress. You're actually in the parade or right by the parade, and the parade is actually passing by you. And so you see the process, you see the particulars. There's an immediacy. You're there watching it happen. This present and imperfect tense form, then, is used to foreground information. The aorist is kind of a base form. It's the one that's used most frequently. And this is for overseeing the parade as an event. Now you're up in a building, say on the 10th floor, and you can see the whole parade. It's a tense form of undefined, seeing the whole as a single event. And so the aorist is used for a background tense. Then when the author wants to foreground something, it jumps to the present or imperfect tense. Then the third aspect is perfective. And this is not a process or particulars or immediacy, but more of a stative, where you have a state of affairs. Uh, this is like viewing the parade from the headquarters. This aspect is used to what he calls front ground material. When you want to say something special or you want to note a state of being or something, you use the perfective tense form. So this aspect way of looking at things holds some potential for us because it breaks the connection between time and tense and puts it into the realm of the author's portrayal of an action in the present imperfect tense form using to foreground material. The aorist is kind of a background seeing the whole and the perfective front grounding materials in more of a stative kind of manner. So this will be another way besides tense equals time, which we've shown is you've got to be very careful with, and action start how the actual verb happens. Aspect gives us the writer's perspective on with how the author desires to portray an action in terms of immediacy, foregrounding, background, seeing a whole, and perfective front grounding state of types of things. So just a different perspective, but it's very helpful at points to be able to have this as a tool in when translating Greek verbs. All right, let's just come back and kind of put these three things together and, and just kind of organize it so we can get a handle on this. The present tense forms. How are we to think about them? First of all, we learn that the present tense equals time connection. And we've said that we've got to loosen that up because the present can be translated sometimes present tense with the present time and sometimes with the past time in a historical or dramatic present. Sometimes the present tense form is translated future, other times customary 
or in a timeless, gnomic manner. The action start way of looking at things sees how the action of the verb actually occurs, whether it's punctiliar, like a point, it happened, durative, inceptive, beginning now, or iterative over and over again. So there are different ways as far as how the action of the verb actually takes place, and that's accounted for in this category of action sart. And thirdly, there's the aspect, and this is the writer's portrayal of the action. If it's present tense, it's focused on the immediacy, the in-process, the particulars happening in front of you, the foregrounding of information, as opposed to the aorist tense, which backgrounds information. So these are just three ways of looking at how the tense forms are actually used in Greek. It allows us a greater flexibility in terms of translation and understanding how the verb tense form is actually working in the discourse. Now, what does all this mean for us, then, in this first-year Greek class and in our translation of simple sentences? Largely, we're going to translate the present tense forms into the present tense for time, but just be aware of all these other potentials. So we're going to translate, he is hit by the rock, undefined. Or, using a more durative action start, he is being hit by the ball. Continuous, more durative type of way. So either of these two translations is how we'll do the present tense form in this class. But realizing that the connection between tense form and time is very, very flexible. So for now, we'll just translate the present tense form into the present tense. Be aware that once you begin reading, that little time markers will pop up. These may be prepositions like before or after, conjunctions like when and until, or adverbs like now, then, today, yesterday. And these little connecting words will mark the actual time of the discourse and how the present active indicative or present middle passive verb form should be translated and how it is actually foregrounding the information. So you've got to be aware of that the actual time is usually specified not by the tense form on the verb, but rather these connecting words will indicate the time of the actual event that's happening in the narrative. But for now, we'll just translate it present tense. Let's switch away from the tense forms for a while and jump over to the voices because this is the chapter on the middle passive voice for the present tense forms. First of all, the active voice. This is where the subject does the action. Terry hit the rock. Terry is the subject and does the action of the verb. Terry hit. The passive form is when the subject receives the action of the verb. Terry was hit by the rock. Now Terry receives the action of the verb, he was hit. Notice by the rock tells the agency or instrument. Put a by what after the verb to reveal the agency. He was hit by what? By the rock. So the rock is the agent or instrument that does the action of the verb. So in English, we have the active and we have the passive voice, as they do in Greek. The passive form often expresses agency via prepositions. And so, for example, if you're wanting to say there's a personal agent, you use hupo, means by. And so, for example, by John. Terry was hit by John. Tells the agent there using hupo. Hupo. 
dia means by or through, and this is kind of an intermediate kind of agency, through your prayers, for example, with dia. For a more impersonal instrument type of thing, by the rock, you'd use in Greek n with the dative. So by or with for the impersonal by the rock, using the preposition n. So hupo, dia, and n express the agency that goes along with the passive verb. Another way to do this is by using the dative case. Do you remember the dative case? To buy for? The by and the with of the dative case can be used in conjunction with the passive verb to express agency or instrumentality. Which is good because then you know who's doing what to whom. The middle voice is something different than what we have in English. It's the voice of participation. It emphasizes the subject taking part in or the personal benefit from the action of the verb. He took it for himself. Sometimes this middle voice can even be taken as a reflexive. For example, Tanya splashed herself, where herself reflects back to what she did. She splashed herself, Tanya. Another way to think of this is, as Dan Wallace has said, the active voice emphasizes the action of the verb, whereas the middle voice emphasizes the actor, or the subject of the verb, whereas the passive will have the action of the verb directed back onto the subject of the verb. Now, sometimes the middle may even change the actual meaning of the verb in special types of verbs. So the middle voice is largely one of participation of the subject in the action of the verb. Many times in English we'll translate that participation simply in the active voice. Deponent verbs are verbs that are missing, that is to lay aside, is what the root originally means, one of the voices. So, for example, a verb does not have an uh, active voice form. That is, writers do not use the active voice form when they go to use the verb. But they do use it in the middle and passive. Often the active form is missing and only the middle passive form is found. Some label this as a deponent verb. Some say that as many as 75% of the middle voices are actually deponents, and then it makes it easy because it, it, then they say, well, if it's, if it's deponent, it's middle in form but active in meaning. So you just translate it as a straight-up active voice, and that's true 75% of the time. Others really question this whole category of deponency, and many see it as not a real category at all, but that the verbs should simply be read as the real middle voice, rather than saying they're deponent, they should just, these verbs should just be read as true middles, emphasizing the participation of the subject in the action of the verb. There's a big debate on this, and at this level in this course, we're not going to solve the debate, but we will take the middle form as the true middle and translate it with the active voice often, emphasizing the participation of the subject in the action of the verb. How does one tell if a verb does not have a, an active form? If when you look it up in the lexicon, like luo, it ends in an omega, then you've got an active form. If it ends, on the other hand, with oh my, then the active form is not present, in the present tense, that is. Now, sometimes a verb may have an active form in the present, but in the future only have 
middle and passive forms. So you've got to check what tense you're dealing with with how the verb interacts with these three voices. You should note passive and middle forms are the same in the present tense, also the imperfect tense, and when we get to the perfect tense. And that the middle and passive forms are only separated in the aorist and future. And so the forms for the middle and passive are exactly the same. But the meanings are quite different in terms of a passive meaning versus the middle where the subject participates in the action of the verb, whereas in the passive the subject is acted upon by the action of the verb. The middle voice will actually eventually die out and in modern Greek they only have the active and passive voices are used, with reflexive pronouns being used to trigger the reflexive idea. The middle in Koine Greek, or Hellenistic Greek, then, emphasizes the subject's involvement in the participation of the verb, or it emphasizes the actor, while the active voice emphasizes the action of the verb. For several major verbs like erkomai and ginomai, these verbs with middle passive ending, omai, ending, will simply be translated into the English as a simple active. And so many times the technical understanding of the middle will not be able to be reproduced in translations. You could say that this idea sometimes gets lost in translation. All right, let's get into the actual morphology on how the present middle indicative form verb is formed. Luomai is I am loosing for myself. Lue is you are loosing for yourself. And Luetai is he, she, it is loosing for himself, herself, or itself. Luomatha is we are loosing for ourselves. Luestha is you are loosing for yourselves. And Luontai is they are loosing for themselves. So you see the endings are Omai, A, Etai, Omatha, Estha, Ontai, similar to the Luo, Ace, A, Omen, Ete, Usi endings we had on the present active indicative verb, Luo. These endings are how you form the present middle indicative. These same endings will be used on the present passive indicative as well. Two birds with one stone. And that's good. The present passive indicative has exactly the same endings as the present middle indicative, but it's translated passively. So we have Luomai, I am being loosed. Lue, you are being loosed. Luetai, he, she, it is being loosed. Luomatha, we are being loosed. Luestha, you are being loosed. And Luontai, they are being loosed. Notice how the action comes back onto the subject. I am being loosed. You are being loosed. And so these are passive forms where the action of the verb comes back onto the subject. That's the passive. So the present middle passive endings, or the primary middle passive endings, are Omai, A, Etai, Omatha, Estha, Ontai, These endings then will be tagged on to middle passive verbs in the present tense. So they match the O, ace, A, omen, et, usi, primary active endings. These are the primary middle passive endings. Which leads us to chant number six. Now we're ready for chant number six, the present middle passive indicative verb. And it goes like this. 
luomai e etai, omatha estha ontai. And once again, luomai e etai, omatha estha ontai. You'll notice that we're just learning the endings now, assuming we can just tag those endings onto the lu beginning. One final time with chant number six. Luomai e etai, omatha estha ontai. That finishes off our present active indicative verbs, and now we have the present middle passive verbs, which means we're done with the present tense. That is a major accomplishment. Congratulations. Now there are a few verbs that are used very frequently that are labeled as deponent verbs. That is, they are middle passive in their root form, but translated active. And these very frequent verbs, we will simply translate them as actives. The first is apokrinomai, I answer. The second is ace ercomai, and it's I come in. Ercomai is I come or go. Ex ercomai is I go out. Ginomai is I become. And por my is I go. And so these are very frequently used verbs, middle passive in form, translated active. For many of the other middle verbs, you'll have to actually look at the verb to see how the actor participates in the action of the verb to see how you actually flesh it out in translation. And in some middle verbs, the whole root idea of the verb may change when it enters the middle voice. Back in chapter 6, when we were studying the prepositions, we noticed that you could add prepositions onto the front of verbs to form compound verbs. Here are several examples of how that happens. Erkomai means I come or go. Ace erkomai adds ace onto the front of the erkomai, and ace means into, so the verb becomes I go in or enter. Ex erkomai adds ek onto the front of erkomai, and that means I go out or leave. Dierkomai adds dia onto the front of erkomai, means I go through. And so you can see how you've got your root verb erkomai and how it can be varied in several different ways by adding prepositions onto the front of it. It's kind of nice. You learn one root verb, and then you've got all sorts of possibilities open up with tagging prepositions on the front of things. Now on to parsing. The format that will be used is the following. Luetai is a PMPI, present, middle, passive, indicative. Third person singular from luo, meaning he, she, it is loosed translating as a passive in this case. Erkontai is a present middle passive indicative or a PM slash P I third person plural from Erkomai meaning they come. And in this case it's translated in a more active way because the verb is uh, a middle and we're taking it as a middle here. Many would see this as a deponent. Usually when you're doing the parsing and you see a middle form like this, 
take the active, highlighting the subject's participation in the action of the verb. Now for the vocabulary of Chapter 9. Our first word is apokrinomai, and it means I answer. The second word, apostello, and it means I send. The third word is balo, and it means I throw. The fourth word is ginomai, and it means I become. The fifth word is ace ercomai. And it means, I come in. The sixth word is, ex ercomai. And it means, I go out. The seventh word is, ercomai. And it means, I come or go. The eighth word is thello, and it means I wish. The ninth word is hutos, and it means thus or so. And the tenth word is poryuomai. And it means, I go.